Okay. Um, first of all, Alan, thank you so much for a terrific introduction. Thank all of you guys for coming out for this splendid event. Uh, thanks to, obviously, Vincent and all the organizers here for making this possible. Um, I, know it's, uh, I know it's a challenge to, uh, to eat and listen at the same time, and it's made even harder because I actually have visuals, so it's ears, eyes, and mouth all at the same time for you guys. I apologize. Um, but when, uh, when Vincent first asked me uh, if I was uh, interested in coming to speak tonight at this 43rd anniversary uh, gala for Chinese uh, for Firm Reaction, I said yes without hesitation. And the reason for that is because I firmly believe that this year in particular is a watershed year, a year in which the principles on which Chinese for Affirmative Action were founded are going to be tested like never before. Uh, so I told him I'd be delighted to share in this event and to share some thoughts around the very, uh, the very heart and soul of this organization, which has grown so much and expanded its mandate and its, uh, its burgeoning area of service so broadly. Chinese for Affirmative Action, obviously, um, in its very name, has affirmative action. This is what it's about. Affirmative action is at the core of this organization, and no matter what else it does, it's advocacy, it's service, it's support of this community, it ultimately stands for a policy, an idea, for a fairer and more just America for us all. And we, as Asian Americans of all backgrounds, as people of all backgrounds, as Americans of all backgrounds, by being here tonight in support of this organization, we stand for that policy. And yet, not everyone in our community stands for it. There is, in fact, this year, an event which is going to occur which might very well change the face of the firm of action forever. For those of you guys who have been following, on February 22nd, the Supreme Court agreed to review a decision uh, in a case called Fisher versus University of Texas, and this is from a quote from Inside Higher Ed. All bets may be off for the future of affirmative action in higher education, depending on the results of this Supreme Court case. More importantly, in a brief file just a few days ago, four Asian American organizations called on the Supreme Court to bar all race-conscious admissions decisions. And the reason why is because they believe that these policies, the policies that allow race to be something that was considered in college admissions for harming Asian Americans, and that the only way for Asian Americans to be treated in a fashion that was fair was to eliminate race as a consideration. The 8020 National Education and Foundation uh, and the three large and, and uh, influential Indian American organizations joined forces to file an amicus curiae brief telling the Supreme Court to strike down the ability to use race as a, a, a means for deciding admissions at the university level. What we've seen uh, is that this is a striking shift in the tenor of what we've said as a community about affirmative action. It's a departure from what this organization has said in its 43-year history, that affirmative action is something that we've benefited from, that America benefits from, and that future generations need. The impact of this, of course, can be felt disproportionately in one area of education, and that's the nation's elite colleges, the colleges which it's almost a caricature that Asian Americans have strived to send their children to or to attend themselves. And I say that, standing on this podium, as somebody who has myself attended one of those elite organizations. The reality is that if, in fact, affirmative action, uh, affirmative action uh, and the ability to use race as a means to decide admissions is struck down, those institutions will become immediately less diverse because those student bodies are dependent on affirmative action and racial preferences to ensure a campus body that looks anything like America. So what we're seeing is that for the first time, institutionally, Asian American organizations are standing up to say that they want to close the gate behind us, we who have benefited from affirmative action, and prevent future generations from that benefit. In short, we want to slam shut the door on a benefit that we ourselves have received. 
And I, for one, think that that is the height of uh, rudeness <laughs> and uh, disproportionate um, ungenerosity of spirit on our part. But in making this decision, they speak primarily about the harm that affirmative action uh, and the racial preferences caused to Asian Americans without thinking about what harm a lack of diversity causes to uh, America as a whole. And what I want to do now is talk a little bit about some of the reasons why firm action still needs to exist, not just for us as a community, but for the nation as a whole. This is a chart that shows what the recent widespread economic downturn has done to America. As you can see, African Americans and Latinos have been disproportionately harmed by the economic crisis, and there's a reason for that. What we've seen is that education has been a, a uh, mechanism, a benchmark that people have used to withstand the downturn, that those who have the skills, ability, aptitude, and credentials have been able to retain, in many cases, their positions, while people with fewer, uh, weaker resumes and fewer such experiences to their credit have lost their professions. Poverty, in turn, makes it harder for people to continue to embrace education to succeed. As we know, we don't start from a level playing field. And despite the fact that people who are looking at affirmative action talk about fairness, the reality is that the lack of fairness that, uh, that people who are poor experience begins from the very beginning, from childhood on. A lack of preparation, a lack of access, a lack of tools, a lack of encouragement. Every aspect of poverty is an injustice and contributes to the unfairness that affirmative action tries to address. The impact of lack of access to education is dramatic and it is painful and ultimately is tragic. A one year increase in average education levels in the state has been found to reduce overall arrest rates by 11% reduced murder and assault rates by almost 30%, motor vehicle theft by 20%, arson by 13%, burglary and larceny by 6%. Crime goes down when people are educated. And unfortunately, we can't even say that this is a matter purely of, of education. We live in a world, in a society, in an America, in which color of skin does in fact make a difference in whether or not we have access to justice. When we look at who is stopped and who is searched and whether those searches are in fact justified, what we find inevitably is that African Americans and Latinos are disproportionately searched without cause. Evidence is not found and then ultimately they're convicted unfairly. White juries disproportionately convict uh, African American defendants. If even a single African American defendant is in a jury pool for an African American, uh, sorry, a single African American is in a jury pool for an African American defendant, the rate of conviction drops from 81% for an all white jury to 71% for a jury pool with a single African American. And this is from a study that was recently conducted by Duke University. The end result, of course, is a correctional system which is disproportionately black and Hispanic. Nationally, 48% of people given life sentences to jail are African American. Black representation in the prison system is 38%. 38% of people who are incarcerated are African American. The impact is not just felt in these communities alone as dramatic and disastrous as it has been for those communities. Every 1% increase in high school graduation rates saves the U.S. economy nearly $2 billion in reduced costs because uh, of reduced criminal activity alone, much less increased productivity for people who have access to skills. So what I'm saying is that lack of education for these groups is a catastrophe of, of proportions that we can't even calculate, and that's only going to grow. It's going to grow with the demographic shift of the population itself. These are the numbers that we look at within many of our lifetimes. And America, which by 2050, is going to be nearly 50% African American and Latino. And yet, in this era, even in an era in which affirmative action in its weakened state still exists, what we see is that 
just at UC Berkeley and across the UC system, Asian American representation is uh, at the level of nearly, uh, back in 1999, uh, 1995, before affirmative action was struck down, was already 37.3%. Latinos, just 17% of entering freshmen in 1995. Blacks, 6.5%. And non-Hispanic whites, 35.7%. After Proposition 209 struck down affirmative action uh, and the use of race in admissions, 10 years later, nearly half of first year enrollment in 2005 in UC Berkeley was uh, Asian American. Latinos had dropped below 10%, blacks to just 3%, and non-Hispanic whites had barely budged at about 30%. The point of all this is to say, in the short term, a striking down of racial preferences may mean a near-term bump in elite admissions, in admissions to institutions that all of us aspire to on some level. But can we do so truly at the expense of the greater fabric of America, the idea of America itself? And more importantly, if we think longer term, is this really who we want to be as a community? Is really who we need to be as a community? I'm gonna switch gears a little bit because uh, the second part of my presentation winds away from the political angle of affirmative action and towards a, a broader sense of what diversity means in culture itself. The fact is, and I'm myself an example of this, we come from a culture where there's a single-minded focus on education in many cases and more often than not a single-minded focus on gaining specific access to specific universities. We have a very narrow set of outcomes that many of our parents or that we ourselves see as being successful. And in the long term, this may actually be detrimental to ourselves. What I want to talk about here is something that, uh, that we can talk about as broadening the horizons. And I'm going to begin by using my own story as a little bit of a case study. So I, I attended Harvard University, <laughs> um, as did uh, Vincent Pan, as did Jeremy Lin, not all of us together. <laughs> uh, and uh, I achieved a, uh, a gentleman's B, otherwise known as an Asian F minus. <laughs> and uh, in doing so, my parents had a specific path set out for me. My father is a physician. Uh, my grandfather's physician, my great-grandfather's physician, five out of seven of my uncles are physicians, <laughs> my sister is a physician. You could say that um, if there's a black sheep without a white coat in the family, it would be me. Uh, in other words, I'm something of an outlier in our family. Uh, and realistically, uh, this is something that has been a cause for dismay at, around the generational dinner table. Uh, my parents uh, frequently wonder whether or not it's not too late for me to go back and get some of my pre-med credits and, uh, and you know, recover the legacy that I've, I've strayed away from. The fact is, there are a lot of Asian American doctors. This is what I tell them. One in five doctors in the United States is Asian. One in four U.S. med students is Asian American. One in three doctors in California is Asian American. And so, this is not to say that this is not incredibly important, that it's not a valuable profession, that generations of my forebears have not been doing great things. But the reality is, we are, there are other pursuits in life that are worth pursuing. Based on personal observation, <laughs> this is, this is what, uh, Medical dramas like House MD should look like. I've been to hospitals. I know what they look like. And, and in any in any pop cultural mirror that actually reflected our reality, every television show would look like this. The reality is, this is what it looked like for its first four seasons. It looked like what many television shows did, and what many movies do, and what most artifacts of our popular culture do. They looked white, with maybe a smattering of representation by people of color standing in the background, secondary, token. For generations, this is where we were, standing in the background. 
sprinkled in with the mix. And one of the things that I've strived with my career, and with my family for that matter, to convince people of is that this is as much of a concern, this lack of diversity in our public image is as much of a concern as the lack of representation of other races in higher education. Diversity is a compelling national interest. This is from uh, liberal firebrand, <laughs> Sandra Day O'Connor, in, uh, in her decision for Cruder versus Bollinger, which uh, was critical because even though it actually weakened affirmative action, it also supported it. This is one of the decisions that is at risk today in the Fisher versus University of Texas case. What she went on to say is that in order to cultivate a set of leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry, it is necessary that the path to leadership be visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity. Access on the visibly. We need to not just be represented, we need to be seen to be represented. And for that to happen, we need to show ourselves. We need to be in the spotlight. We need to be in the focal point. A friend of mine, Eric Liu, who's an author, uh, a uh, public intellectual, if you will, um, the author of a book called The Accidental Asian, uh, he wrote a piece for Time Magazine recently which talked a little bit about why it is that diversity is so important. It's not just a matter of uh, uh, respect, it's not just a matter of ideals, it's a matter of power, because Diverse teams perform better. It's been seen time and time again that homo homogeneity, single-mindedness, uh, any kind of pool which does not constitute a real mix of ideas, a real mix of skills and backgrounds is weaker than one that has a full blend, a full mosaic, a full representation. Diversity trumps ability. Social scientist Scott Page has written an entire book about this, showing that uh, with with Organizations, in corporations, teams that have multiple backgrounds, multiple cultures represented, perform better on almost every level than those that are monocultural or mono heritage ones or uh, singular in the way they think. So Eric went on to say in this article, diversity is our American advantage. It's our advantage in business. It's our advantage in sports. It really is our advantage in sports. <laughs> um, and it's our advantage in the marketplace of ideas. I want to point to a single individual out of those uh, who are on that page. It's a woman named Mindy Kaling. And those of you guys who actually watch uh, primetime television, uh, who enjoy sitcoms like The Office, will recognize her. She is a writer and actress. Uh, who appears on that show as a performer, but is also an executive producer and one of the creators of uh, some of the funniest and most lauded episodes of that long-running series. And um, Mindy uh, comes from a very similar background to myself. She actually went to, to Dartmouth. Um, I was not able to find a Dartmouth logo, unfortunately. She's class of 2001. Uh, and um, her mother was a doctor, as are many members of her extended family. But instead of going to med school, she convinced her parents to let her uh, work as a paralegal and hone her comedy writing. She decided early on that that was the path she wanted to pursue, that even though the idea of a woman of color, uh, a South Asian woman in an era in which there were no South Asians on TV breaking into that particular profession uh, was kind of crazy, that she would do it. She would spend her time and effort and make the sacrifice necessary to succeed. As my mom would say, what went wrong? <laughs> Um, and she has succeeded. This is from a, um, a quote uh, from an a article uh, interviewing Mindy Kaling in the New York Times. Black and white are not the only colors of diversity. In recent years, there's been a startled, largely unheralded boom of South Asian characters thanks to writers and actors like the office's Mindy Kaling. And so, in the wake of Mindy Kaling, what do we see? Well, first we saw some diversity in House MD. Our friend Kalpen Modi, who many of you know from uh, other pursuits, uh, joined the team of House 
And then shortly thereafter, a remarkable occurrence took root across sitcom television, sitcom land. We saw South Asians in virtually every part of prime time. Uh, in roles, in many cases, they're not written for Asian Americans, representing as dramatists, as comedians, as people who were human beings uh, across a full range of different pursuits and different positions. For the first time, South Asians were proven to be people who could uphold a role on television. They publicly performed. They were, uh, for the first time, being accepted by people in positions of power as people who could draw eyes and make people laugh. It's just a, an example of how giving opportunity to one or a few can make opportunity for many. And I would submit that affirmative action gives that first critical opportunity, after, of course, which we're on our own. This is Mindy now. Mindy Kaling, in this coming season, has been given her own show. It is called The Mindy Project. It'll be on Fox Television right after New Girl. And it is considered to be one of the most anticipated and potentially successful new programs on television. The Mindy Project is not about being Asian American. It's about being a woman who happens to be Asian American and single and funny and smart and a doctor. <laughs> so I guess these things do come full circle. Anyway, thank you very much.